Welcome to the Voices of War, a podcast with a simple vision, to bring to life the true costs of war through the voices of those who've lived it. I'm your host, Maz, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Today, I'm speaking with Paul Marshall. He's a recently retired British Army officer who spent 34 years in uniform. He has deployed on multiple military operations all over the world, including on combat, peacekeeping and post-conflict recovery operations. He started his career in South Korea as a UN observer before spending time in Bosnia and Herzegovina during some of the most difficult times of that war. He also took part in both Gulf Wars as part of the fighting forces. In the subsequent years, he supported a number of global crises and natural disasters before once again returning to Bosnia and Herzegovina in 2014, except this time in the prestigious role of the United Kingdom Defence Attaché. Paul, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, thanks for having us, Roger. It's good to be here. So just a short disclaimer for our audience. Uh, uh, I've actually met Paul some time ago in Sarajevo. In fact, I, I did some uh, work uh, with him or for Paul. Paul, somebody who's got an extensive military background, uh, as you would have heard in the introduction. Uh, but perhaps, Paul, you can uh, maybe just give us a short synopsis of, of your journey. Okay. 34 years in the British Army. I joined in August of 1985 and I retired in February of 2018. Uh, I completed tours all over the world, including in the United Nations Military Arms Commission in Korea, tours in Bosnia. I did both the first Gulf War and second Gulf War and was fortunate enough to support military operations and through logistics around the world for things like the tsunami, Hurricane Katrina, etc. Uh, and I finished my career as the defence attaché for the United Kingdom in Sarajevo from 2014 to 2017. Wow, what a what a distinguished career, and, uh, and uh, you know, spanning nearly three and a half decades. You you mentioned you've been to Korea, so probably at the DMZ as well. You've spent some time at the demilitarized zone. I was. I was fortunate enough at that time to be commanding uh, Gurkha troops, uh, and we were providing the British contingent, and I was known as the the baby Brit because I was a <laughs> lieutenant. And one of my roles was to be at the DMZ as the British presence with my platoon, and as part of that role, cover for my uh, brigadier, who may or may not have been in the country. And therefore, <laughs> I got the, I had the privilege of sitting at the table at one stage opposite the North Koreans. Very oh, wow. interesting uh, scenarios. Talk a little bit about that. How, how was that? Interesting. As a, a young lieutenant, you are really have no kind of shape or form about what's really going on around you. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know you're worried about whether your boys are fed and is the mail getting through and suddenly we have a, a major incident which requires the whole of the peace village to come to together. Uh, so the whole of the southern side sitting there with the commander of the UNMAC in his role of, uh, as mm-hmm. questioning and challenging the North Koreans' concepts and view of something that had happened, a shooting that had supposedly happened across the DMZ. Wow. Uh, and really as a young lieutenant, I was in awe thinking that that it's quite a serious conversation. We know that they've got weapons all charged and we're actually calling them, we're calling it out to their face and challenging them, which was very, very interesting. Yeah, that's, I mean, I I was fortunate to go to the DMZ myself during my training. I I spent a week in South Korea and we had a visit at the 38th parallel where the peace huts go across, uh, where the actual border is, where, where, you know, all the photos are being taken with the South Korean soldiers on one side, kind of hiding half behind the hut with their aviator sunglasses staring across on Mm -hmm. the other side. I found that experience. Yeah. Sorry, John. Because one of the, the... The darker sides of that tour is that uh, when the North Koreans are feeling that they need something back from the South, they will offer the bones of a serviceman. Could be American, could be Brit, could be one of the nations that uh, supported South Korea. And as the United Nations Military Honor Guard token gesture, Mm. uh, the Brit is the, the guy on point. And so the North Koreans will bring down a coffin to the DMZ, um, those huts you mentioned, yeah. in between those huts, the big white line, Yes, yeah. guys will be on this side, 
they would bring the coffin over and we had a set drill where the coffin would be passed halfway, halfway across, my North Korean counterpart would open the coffin. I would look inside and of course, all I could see were bones. Yeah. Did they belong to a human? Best guess, I think they do. Yeah. Uh, therefore, we'll accept the bones on good faith, but we didn't know whose they were or, or we'd been told whose they were, but we needed to confirm that. So they would come back in into the coroner, DNA testing was not mm. available that time. Mm, mm, so we're looking at dental records, we're looking at anything we could find. Uh, and of course, the North Koreans have had that those bones potentially for since 1954. It's now 1998. Mm. You know, adding dog tags, adding teeth, you know, mm. lots of things could happen. So okay. my role was really just to accept it, move it on down the line, and then for others to confirm who it was. Yeah, so, so, so that's what I was going to ask. So those bodies were, were most likely from the actual war rather than in any way post. Correct. The North Koreans would uh, clearly have held on to stuff. They knew where it was. Their claim was, oh, we've just come across it. We should give it you back. We were all very clear. They, 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 these were bargaining chips for them. They felt they'd release them at certain times and when they felt it was beneficial to them. As, as a young lieutenant, as you said, I mean, how, how, how did that impact you? I think it began to tough me up to you know the actual side of war, which they don't teach you about. Mm. People talk about the glamour of going forward, crossing the front. But mm. When I started, there was very little training about the other side. How many of your platoon were going to come back? How many mm. of uh, the people around you were you not going to see again tomorrow? Mm. Yes, there's all the, the great concepts of leave your, leave your guy and be picked up by the medic and taken back. But nobody at that time in, in the mid 80s, there, were, there was no training about losing people. And that's an area that I began to unfortunately specialize in over my career. So wow. it certainly was an eye opener. When you say that's an area you began to specialize, I mean, and I want to touch on the various experiences you have, but what, 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 do you, what, what do you mean by that? Well, um, we've talked about me serving in Bosnia in 94. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was the first campaign the British Army returned soldiers to the UK. Prior to that, you f- you were buried where you fell, mm. in a military graveyard, and the mm. Commonwealth War Graves Commission maintained these beautiful graves across yeah. the world. But my understanding is from 94 onwards, the decision was made that British soldiers should be returned to the United Kingdom. And therefore, we had uh, there had been instances before the First Gulf War. We had a young soldier who was returned, that was a, but it wasn't. En masse. We didn't have major casualties that we needed to. But one of the things that we, we didn't have together was it's not just about getting the young soldier home. or It's about the whole procedure that goes around it, you know, the, yeah. informing the family, making sure that the soldiers that were close to him are looked after, that the post-activity includes getting the, the guys to talk about it, to open mm. up, to mm. see where they can see what is, is there something there is there something dark there that's yeah. upsetting them H- how do you deal with that um, mm-hmm. and we didn't have things in place in the first gulf war at all to handle that it was yeah. make it up as you went go along yeah, yeah. And, and survive survive as best as you can yeah and, use the team get the team to talk yeah uh, and, and that is always a good way but the issue now is the team is together for those operations and then they separate afterwards how do you continue that talk how do you continue them opening up and and i definitely want to touch on this because i think the uk much like much like australia has had multitude number uh, of more casualties from the recent conflicts in iraq and in afghanistan at home through suicide than through combat casualties so i think that's that's uh, i think you touch on an important point there yeah so uh, it, it's the whole gambit of how you deal with that and certainly i was fortunate uh, at the time people thought it was a lot of casualties but the second Gulf War, I was actually in the fight, what they called the fighting phase. And that's a bit of a misnomer. You know, the ground troops going in did not suffer as much as those who then held the ground afterwards. Mm. So mm. those soldiers that followed in and were there on the ground for six months yeah. uh, and were being shot at and snipered at and everything else, I was fortunate that we didn't have that intensity. But there are friends of mine who've been in Baghdad supposedly pushing a desk, as we'd say, but who were mortared two or three times a day. And they certainly feel that today and suffer. some of them suffer quite badly from that. 
Yeah, and I think you, you, you're right. It's a, it's we rarely speak about that. I mean, it's a there, there is a there is a stigma attached both to that to expressing any kind of trauma from war, but also you know as you said, you know somebody who's sitting at a desk, we don't necessarily consider them as quote unquote war fighters, but it's generally those fighting forces up the front. Um, and as you say, they're generally on the ground for a lot shorter period of time, or they push through. But you said you were part of the fighting force in 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 Gulf One or Gulf Two. Or- uh, yeah, Gulf One. Um, so when we say fighting force, I was the logistics element supporting the artillery. Mm-hmm. So uh, my uh, role as operations officer at the time was to make sure that the artillery received their ammunition on time, in place to put a fire mission in. What that fire mission was, not my concern. But certainly you began to think about it and, and some of the gunners said something and it affected the boys, you know, these shells are going to hit X, Y and Z. And you suddenly began realise that actually it's, it's not just a training area in Germany anymore. Mm-hmm. We're now putting live rounds onto a target. You didn't know who they were. You didn't know the size and shape. You just knew they were the enemy and yeah. they, need, they need to be moved out of the way so we could move through safely. And certainly at that time, we brought in the multi-launch rocket system into the British mm-hmm. Army. It was known as the grid square removal service. Yeah. 22 rockets could take out a grid square. Well, when you think about that on the ground, that is mm. huge area. And yes, it may be open desert, yeah. but when you're in Iraqi and you're on the bottom end of that, there is nowhere to hide. And certainly a lot of the soldiers we came across, and as we moved forward, one of the big things we had was taking prisoners. It wasn't a question of clearing out trenches. These yeah. people were just so demoralized from the whole life they had to date, they could not give up quicker than they did. And then it's treating them with humility, realising, and for them to realise they are being treated with humility. The first Gulf War, they had no idea that they would be treated. They thought they'd watched all the movies. You know, what happens in movies, you get caught, you get things happen. But the UN Convention is very clear on the treatment of prisoners. We're drilled into them, drilled into us, of the things that we were permitted to do and more importantly the things that we were not permitted and we had senior NCOs and the officers fully trained to step in and help some of the people understand no you don't take pictures of them no yeah. you don't laugh at them they are they are people and they have no idea what's going to happen next they're frightened they haven't been fed so they need feeding with the proper food because they you know our ration packs weren't uh friendly towards yeah. them so we had to extract food from the ration pack and trying to explain to an individual you know, that you can have my ration pack but there are certain things in it that your religion won't allow you to eat Amazing. so and luckily we found some english speakers who took over and were able to extract and then a couple of mullahs came along and it was all clear that they could eat whatever they could eat because that's all they'd had in weeks how was that experience? Yeah. That, that to me is the essence of what I want to talk about in this podcast. That, that to me strikes me as, as a particularly human experience, right? So here is this professional military that's overwhelmed uh, mm-hmm. a, an enemy to the point where they were already demoralized because of you know, the circumstances they found themselves, but they were now overwhelmed by a superior fighting force. You know, I, I suspect, and, and, and maybe I'm reading between the lines, but I suspect, you know, that adrenaline takes over and you also had to rein in some of the, some of the uh, maybe egos or some of the younger soldiers who probably enjoyed the fact that they had just won a pretty decisive victory. And one of the things you had to do was put the right people in charge of mm. those mm-hmm. tasks. So, for instance, we, we were supporting ammunition. At one point, I'm guessing uh, by... It's my memory is going now, but I'm thinking between 100 and 120 prisoners gave themselves up in one go. Just came out of the ground 200 metres in front of us and gave themselves up to the young lad who was having a cup of tea and hadn't even realised they were there. You're suddenly looking after these 120 people. You've got to make sure all those rules of engagement are followed and all the procedures for moving them down the line And you're suddenly thinking, well, we're in the middle of the desert. How am I going to move them? Well, the only way we can move them is on the back of an empty truck. Right, right. We come from Europe, so you're thinking health and safety. Or can we put them (laughs) Um, Okay, lads, put some straps over the back of the trucks that you normally put the loads down on. 
We'll put them on the back. We'll show them how to get under these straps so they've got something to hold on to. But it's better than walking. But, Corporal Jones, just make sure you don't drive fast. You know, yeah. let's get them to where we need to get them. Let's get them handed across to the prison war holding you. And that's where they can be looked after in a better way than us, or that we can do, because we're not geared to do this. We're yeah. supposed to collect them, move them on as well. No interrogations, no yeah. nothing. We're just going to... The, the only the thing we did was look for the, bit, the officer. Has the officer got any information that might be of value to us? Well, there's no officers here. They left six weeks ago. Well, okay. So let's move them on. And that was that, was that part. But the, I suppose the worst part of that operation was you'll have heard of a place called Mukla Ridge or Mukla Ridge. So just north of Kuwait City on the Route 80, which goes from Kuwait City back up to, um, um, I think it's Umm is uh-huh. uh, in Iraq. The American and RAF caught the Iraqis fleeing Kuwait, uh, and it was just a bloodbath. They took out over 3,000 vehicles in a stretch of less than 10 kilometers. And when I say 10 kilometers, it's 10 kilometers long, it may be shorter or less, and about 400 meters wide. Uh, and they caught the Iraqis and just obliterated everything that moved on that road. And I have a friend who uh, was unfortunately given the job of clearing the soldiers and the bodies from that location. And yes, they were the graves unit, but he has never been the same since. Uh, it's, it's not a nice part of war yeah. to suddenly find out you've got a couple of thousand bodies that you need to go and get parts from. Mm. You've got to try, identify them, move them back along into the chain, and then we've got to inform through the uh, Red Cross, yeah. as the uh, rules were, that these people have been found, uh, unfortunately, are dead. And, yeah. uh, and those are the rules of engagement that you, yeah. you sit under. Yeah. But even to this day, uh, I was looking at a photograph last night before this podcast, mm-hmm. there are still vehicles in that area that haven't been cleared. So that's so that's from 2001. So we're looking at 30 years ago. And how does one come back from that? I mean, you mentioned your friend that was there to clear the bodies. I mean, what that, that must have been an absolutely horrifying experience and, and undoubtedly one that he, he has never forgotten, I'd imagine. Uh, not at all. When we came to the Second World War, he was working with me. And unfortunately, there were certain things that just reminded him of that time. The Second Gulf War, we actually formed up just north of the Mutler Ridge. So you can imagine you know, he had to come along that road to get to us. Uh, it, was, it was the memories that were, came flooding back in then were just immense. No, that's, uh, I, 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 can, I can only imagine what that would have been like. I just want to touch a little bit more on the. Oh, so, so when you received the prisoners, uh, and as you said, they kind yeah. of gave themselves up, and 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 they were they were broken. Their morale was broken. What was it like for them to realise that it's not going to be like in the movies? They're not about to all get lined up against the wall and, uh, and you know shot, so to speak, but that they will be treated uh, in accordance with the you know Geneva Conventions, and that they will be given food, and you know to, to have even somebody care about their religious requirements for food. I mean, what what can you describe that? What was it like for them? I mean, could you seek the transition or the disappearance of fear, or or, or you know what, what was it like? Well, when we initially got them, most of the Iraqi army were conscripts, so very few had any smatting of Eng- we had no smatting of Iraqi. So the language barrier was immense. So you're trying to describe to a very frightened, he thinks the worst is going to happen to him no matter what happens. But I had some very good senior NCOs and corporals who were in charge, who took the time, were calm, were demonstrating to a prisoner what they were going to do. You know, here's some food. Mm -hmm. We're going to eat it. So I'm then going to give you uh, a tin of food, which has had some food taken out of it, but I'm just trying to prove to you that, that there is able. nothing wrong yeah. with the food. I've eaten it. And then trying to, in very broken English, trying to explain to them that we need them to get on the wag- the trucks mm-hmm. so that we can mm-hmm. take them to the next location. And then it, probably about the two-hour point, maybe a bit longer, somebody then puts his hand up amongst the Iraqi prisoners and said, um, I speak English. All oh, right. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, That'll be easy. at yeah. least we've got somebody. And then you're talking to the guy and, and uh, he said, well, why didn't you tell us? He said, well, I just didn't know what was going to happen. 
but then I've seen over the last couple of hours you've been making the attempt. We're, we've we've not been mistreated. Uh, you've been feeding us. You've been giving us water. You've medically treated those that needed medically treated uh, treatment. This is this is clearly not something that we were prepared for. Yeah. We were expecting the worst. We were told if we you know, surrendered, the unmentionable things would happen. Uh, and it was only at that point you suddenly realised, you know, I'd never seen it through that set of eyes. So, yeah, we can try and second guess what they're thinking, but we just didn't know the pure fear they had in surrendering. Mm -hmm. So to stand up and you know, 120, you know, they had overcome tremendous fear thinking that. And when you look back on it, what was what was worse that made them come out to something which was going to be so horrible to in their mind? There was something yeah. behind them yeah. that said, "We this is the worst of two evils. Let's go there." And then yeah. you could see that the relief come across some of them to say, "You know, nothing is going to happen. We're just going to get on this truck. We've been fed. We've been watered, uh, and we're going to go down here." But again. They didn't really know where they were going. Neither did we. We didn't know where the prisoner yeah. of war holding location was going to be set up. And how long are they going to be on the back of my truck? I don't know. We have no idea. I, I know we're at point X, but you don't know where you are because you're not allowed either. I do. But I don't know when, they, when the follow-on forces that we had were going to come through yeah. to set up the prisoner of war. So how long have I got them? Well, I've got them until I hand them over. And I must look after them. I, put, I must put troops to those tasks to guard mm -hmm. them, feed look them, after them yeah, yeah. and look after them. And if they need treatment, uh, the medic will treat them. And, and that came as a pretty much of a shock to those, some of those Iraqis. They weren't expecting that kind of treatment. And you could see the relief on some of their faces. Uh, and then the message got to go out. And then suddenly they were, they were far more easier to look after. Here's your rations for the, yeah. this afternoon. Yes, thanks very much. Yeah. So you're, you're the English. You sort it out. Okay. we're more than happy to do that because we know there's enough rations for everybody here. What a, what a wonderful experience. I mean, I, I, and I suspect, you know, in that madness that, uh, you know, we call combat or, you know, particularly in your instance, kind of being one of the, or, or following on from the, from the initial forces coming in, I suspect that would have been quite a, quite a different experience because I'd imagine you guys would have uh, taken some fire as well throughout your, throughout your time there as well. Well, it, it was, uh, there was... Small. Luckily, we were only a small arms fire. Uh, yeah. Luckily, the we had literally pulverized the Iraqis at this point. They had nothing left, and the tanks up front had taken just about everything out as it went yeah. through. So it, it took us a while to realize we we had expected the worst. But as you move forward, you suddenly saw that the web place had been literally cleared yeah. by our armor. Uh, we, we had the new challenges then we had they were new then yeah <laughs> they've been yeah. replaced a couple of times since yeah uh, we had the warrior fighting vehicles which were new at the time so we had some tremendous equipment which yeah. gave us the confidence and certainly that fear of fight uh, mm -hmm. there were certain things and you know, I, I was just on facebook today somebody sent me a message saying realize boss it was 30 years ago today that we were in al jabal yeah. And there's a picture of my staff quartermaster sergeant eating oh. food on the chow line uh, 30 years ago. And he said, what a great experience. Would you do it again, boss? No, I would go to Saudi again. I don't think I want to do this again. Yeah, said, yeah that's probably what I meant. But you know me, yeah. boss. You know? Yeah. yeah. But, it is a, but that's an interesting point. I mean, uh, 30, 30 years ago, you know, one of your subordinate sends you a message through referring to you as a boss i mean that's a i find that quite unique to the military or maybe to the experiences that people go through together right i mean there's there's i suspect that there's an overwhelming sense of you know on one hand excitement because you know you're going to do the job that you've trained to do but there's probably also a sense of or fear uncertainty you know you're entering uh, an unknown you don't know what's going to happen and you go through perhaps some of your most challenging and hardest times through with this random group of blokes or girls uh, that you've been put together is, is is that is that a fair is that a fair assessment that these are kind of special friendships that are that are, that are, that are forged under these circumstances uh, i think they are because uh, certainly from that particular operation i probably am in contact with 20 or 25 people on a regular basis of yeah. who reminisce one of my co colleagues, he was uh, a fellow officer, had been 
attached to us from another unit. And again, came with uh, 20 of his soldiers, given a task. Uh, and he said to me at the time, he said, you know, the unit I'm with would be checking me every five minutes. What you're saying is get on and do the task. I said, that's your job, mate. If, yeah. if, you, if, if you don't feel you can do it. He said, no, I can. It's just mm-hmm. I've never been given that trust. And, yeah. and his particular mission, he suffered greatly for uh, some of the... Um, he saw the after effects of the artillery fire. And he decided at the end of that conflict that the army wasn't for him. And I only found out a couple of uh, years ago when I sent him a picture of us, we had one of those ubiquitous, you know, here we are in the desert, yeah. let's have an officer's photograph with yes. all the officers present sitting in their rows with their hands crossed, etc. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and I, I sent him these pictures and, and I had not realised that he had suffered so badly that he had lost all his memorabilia from that time. He had been medically evacuated. I had left before this happened. Right. He'd been medically evacuated out and all of his kit had gone missing. So he didn't have his camera or his photographs yeah. or anything. Uh, and I happened to send it to him and he said, wow, that's the only picture of me. You don't have any more. I said, well, I've got like 10 or 11 of them here. Would you like them? He said, don't send them all in one go, but I would like them. So we drip fed them over time. Uh, but he, he tells me he still suffers, but he chose a career after that, which meant he had nothing to do with the army. He he's he is actually a, a one of these saturation diving instructors for the I wouldn't say commercial. It's it's for the the hobby. Apparently, there are people who like to go very deep commercial dive, <laughs> uh, very deep diving, and he does that nitric oxide instructing, yeah. and he finds his peace underwater. Yeah, no so. doubt. I mean, this is another. Yeah. I guess that's the you mentioned it already before. I mean, it's the the, the scars of war come in in, in all shapes and sizes, and. Uh, uh, you don't necessarily have to have been in combat per se or even been shot at, but just seeing some of those things. And, and that, I guess, is a, perhaps a, an interesting segue. I, I don't want to say a good segue because there is very rarely anything good about these types of conversations. But you you spent time in Bosnia, uh, and this was after the uh, Ahmici uh, massacre uh, that occurred in yeah. April 93. Describe that. What what? Or maybe just for context, and I'll probably provide a little vignette in here as well, uh, separately. Maybe just let our listeners know a little bit about the massacre, and then what what you found, what you had to deal with. Okay, so the Amici massacre was a uh, Amici is a, a small village, just uh, uh, I'm just trying to think of the name, south of uh, uh, where in the middle of Bosnia Herzegovina. It will come back to me exactly where it was, and I'm looking thinking of the name now. One night in 1993, the, an element of the village decided the other element should die. And if I'm correct, 135 Muslim elements of the Armichi village were killed. The minaret was blown and toppled. And this was all done by the neighbours, their neighbours, some of whom have been together around for 90 years, but took part in this genocide. Is it genocide is the right word? I think genocide it was called. Or, yeah. And so the issue was that the, the British forces were just up the road and were first on the scene, the 1st Battalion, the Cheshire Regiment, and they're on the scene the following morning. Uh, and uh, Colonel Bob Stewart, now a, minister, a member of Parliament in the UK, was the commanding officer who, whose AO, or Area of Operations, Armichi fell into. Uh, and he his unit were responsible for making sure it was cleared and making sure that the citizens who had died were correctly identified, well, were correctly recovered from the scene and that as much evidence as possible could be recovered, understanding that there's fighting going on all all around. At the time, we were, uh, the Brit were wearing blue helmets, the Mm -hmm. United Nations, and we're under strict rules of engagement. So at that time, you were not allowed to open fire unless it was to defend yourself. So if somebody was firing at a group of children next to you, that was not good enough for you to open fire because it wasn't threatening you. So that was the sort of context of uh, of that evening from from the perspective I had. Bring it round uh, the following year when I was in part of the brigade headquarters that was out there, 
we are still in the United Nations. And there is a great political push to gather evidence to prosecute as soon as possible those who perpetrated and could be found guilty of those crimes. Now, in order to do that, there's a lot of factual evidence. And there was a thought that they would fly in a specialist team uh, found from the United Nations into an area where actually we had troops on the ground putting themselves in harm's way between the Serbs and the Croats, mm. between the Croats and the Bosniaks and the mm. Bosniaks and the Serbs mm. and other parties, Mujahideen, yeah. etc. So this was to us the right thing to do, but the wrong time. You're just keeping a lid on the fighting. People aren't shooting at children anymore. If you bring in that team, does it open up those wounds? Does it say, look, we've got to get, let's start it. Let's get rid of some of this evidence. Let's open up that can of worms again. Let's start asking questions, right? Yeah. Let, well, let's not ask the question. Let's yeah. just get rid of anybody who can answer the question. And that was a decision not taken lightly by the commander to say, look, this is not the right time. I understand you want to come in and we should come in as soon as possible, but it's not the right time. And that decision had to go all the way up to the top into Sarajevo and for the UN commander then to make, to be briefed, to understand the issue, to understand the political connotations versus the tactical activity that would occur afterwards. And that's why it had to be taken at that level. And the team was stood down for a number of months in order that the situation on the ground could stabilise even more. And they came in later to do that fact-finding recovery. So, yeah. And using the evidence that the Cheshires had carefully gathered when they were in there in 93 has led to the findings and the being able to uh, identify uh, you know, those 135 people, yeah. some of whom were children in, in our meeting. So... And, and that still, it still goes on today. So um, in 2015, I think when I was back in Bosnia, Herzegovina, there was still a follow on from Armichi, which we can discuss later when we, but it was all connected and all linked in that way. We can touch on it now. I mean, it's a, it, it, there's a natural link to it because uh, I think it's really interesting and in that you went back into Bosnia, what is it, 2014 to 2017, this time as the defence attaché. And, mm -hmm. and was that some of your remit to tie off some of those loose ends, I suppose? Uh, no, uh, it was the defence attaché has a mm -hmm. very broad brush activity set by the, yeah. the, their parent government. And you are the eyes and ears of your country yeah. in that other country. So... Yeah. The sheer fact that UK had been there before, I had access to information and there are certain things going on there. Uh, you've got the United Nations, was it the Missing Persons Commission? You've got, uh, you've got the United Nations still fully active even to this day in those activities and they are still finding graves of people that were dug during the, the time of the, uh, the conflict in uh, the early 90s. And it was just that my experience of being there before and meeting some of the people that had been part of the conflict, had been in Sarajevo or had been in Gorni Vukuf, and remembered the Brits, remembered the Brit Battalion, and some who, uh, I was fortunate enough, remembered me, which was, <laughs> I was there for a six-month period, mainly based in Split, but going forward quite regularly. And it was, it was quite eye-opening when somebody says, you were here before in... 94, and you go, wow. wow. But wow. that memory they had uh, was fully. But a colleague of mine had been in Armichi the day after. I say colleague, a friend, I should mm -hmm. say. Uh, he was part of the United Nations team on the ground. And he went in there and was part of the clearing of the people of Armichi uh, to make sure those who had died that evening were correctly looked after uh, and were moved back to some of the uh, big mortaries that were now needed to be in place for these activities. And some 20 years later, they are still identifying people from Bosnia-Herzegovina who are held in these mortaries in body bags because 
nobody is able, maybe their family were killed at the same time. Mm-hmm. Who, who knows who they are? But we have some very dedicated Bosnian people who uh, I can only think of the Schiller Holmes of that world who can take a piece of DNA and then link it to a family and, and follow it through to the nth degree where they can be 100% certain that the body they have in the morgue is related to this person. Uh, and you don't do that lightly. You don't go and tap on somebody's door 20 years later and say, we've now identified your father, your brother, your sister, father, your, your sister. cousin, niece, or whatever, yeah. unless you are 100% sure. I take my hats off to these people who yeah. make sure they are 100% sure before that comes up and they collect stuff. They are collecting bones, bodies, and putting them together. Uh, and, and that was a tremendous insight into the other side, you know, Bosnian conflict for five years. The aftermath still yeah. goes on 20, 25 years later. We're st- they're still pulling pieces together. Minefields are still being clear. Yeah. You, know, you and I were, uh, well, you were there when the floods happened in 2014. Yeah. There was an awful lot of munitions that had been dumped in the rivers that suddenly became clear, were cleared because the rivers gouged out their, their banks. Uh, we had bags of grenades that had just been thrown in the river suddenly being found by children. Well, yeah. that was a window so, we went out uh, to, Yeah, yeah. So just, just on that point, we, we went out to, to do a clearance. So we were lucky to have been asked to lead 200 uh, university students from the philosophy uh, faculty at the Sarajevo University. Uh, and as we got... Uh, to Mugla, I think, uh, on the first instance, that's that was one of the things that they warned us of. You know, stay away from these areas because there were minefields around the uh, southeastern side. Uh, we don't know what's happened to those minefields, so no one is to go to that area, which was a <laughs> an eye opener, not least for me, but also for the uh, for these university students. Uh, all of a mm-hmm. sudden, uh, you know, they've they they've all been touched by war in some sense. They're all post war generation. But here they were now going to help clear the streets of Maglai of, uh, you know, mud and water, but all of a sudden mm-hmm. to be warned about, you know, potentially looking out for landmines as well that have been washed in. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, when I arrived back in 2014, the first thing that I was requ- required, I was asked to do, is the European force, which now takes mm-hmm. the lead in Bosnia, mm-hmm. Arena, have a mine education service. And myself, my wife, went out and were briefed on the mine threat in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And it was an eye-opener of what was left and the fact that people were still out there trying to make a living. Some of these farmers are finding mines and throwing them to the side of the fields because they need to grow their field. Uh, They need to grow their uh, crops. And some of the pictorial evidence they gave us just to just to sow that seed to say this is not made up this is yeah. true we have children we have mothers we have daughters we have fathers we have mm-hmm. sons who to this day are still finding mines and being blown up by mine yeah. uh, and, and this that it was a very uh, in comparison very, very small corridor which turns over 10,000 square kilometers of minefields which are still there today because nobody kept records mines were thrown down not following a pattern of that we have become used to in the uh, yeah. european armed forces you know you there's a pattern to your minefield so when you find find the right one you know the pattern it's going to be in that's not the case in bosnia so there are still a lot of injuries going on there a lot of death through minefields it's a, a, absolutely horrible. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it, it's a, it's scary. And I just think back to even even around the, the capital Sarajevo. I mean, around the mountains, there are still kind of uh, taped off areas, careful mines. Uh, and this is the capital, uh, you know, an Olympic city. But I just wanted to uh, just go back to Ahmetu for one one second because I think mm-hmm. one point that's that's important to highlight and, and just for some context, if I if I remember correctly, and, I, and I've read some stuff and, and watched some videos on on the Ahmetu uh, massacre. You said of women and children. I mean, these were these were some absolutely horrendous deaths. I mean, where people were locked into their houses, the houses were burned, uh, you know, with them in it. And and some of the British soldiers found bodies. You know, they had to dig them up, 
uh, and they were so charred that, 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 that they realized that uh, flamethrowers had to have been used and, and these sorts of things. What, what happens to people? What happens to people? And, and as you said, this was neighbor on neighbor, right? Some of them lived there for 90 years mm. next door to each other. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, they flicked the switch and, and maybe not this 90-year-old used the flamethrower, but mm-hmm. certainly uh, some of them supported that, that effort. What happens? You know, what, how does that happen? Uh, I, I don't know. And, and certainly a, a year later when, I, I was, when you are listening to some of the story and you're understanding that a guy stood in front of you ha- still has no compassion about mm-hmm. what happened. As far as they're concerned, they were perhaps or Muslims. They weren't a Serb, so it's okay. Now, that said, our meter is one point. There, there were lots of atrocities around yeah. which happened to yeah, each other. But yeah. in this particular area, the neighbours, something flipped. I, 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 to this day, I cannot understand what would make you turn on your neighbour that you've known for 70, 80, 90 years in such a way that's brought about by your ethnic background. And it's okay to the guy that you went and helped plough the field, the guy who helped make you Slivovich for years, suddenly you are happy to condone his death in a brutal way and not even bat an eye about it. Yeah. And, and that was a, a real home, bringing a home point for Bosnia Herzegovina, is understanding the tensions within that country that clearly have been underlying and been capped or kept in place by Tito and his regime, but they were just under the surface. And it was something we were not familiar with or ready for or yeah. able to comprehend that neighbour would turn on neighbour. And, and when you look at details of that conflict and you realise that you know, Serbs were fighting Croats, Croats were fighting Bosniaks, Bosniaks were fighting yeah. Serbs, Croats were fighting Bosniaks were fighting Serbs. Yeah, yeah. And in some cases, you were going, wait a minute, up north, you are paired as a friend. Down here, you're fighting as an enemy. Uh, how, how, does that, how does that compute? Yeah. And, and again, it was all to do with you know, you, your village could be different to the village just next door. And those tensions are still there today, as, as you yeah. know. And when you have conversations, most people in Bosnia-Herzegovina can tell you step by step their view of the conflict and you can listen to one view move one village over and they will give you a different completely different view of the same issue that you've just been briefed on so dramatically by the first village and you have to carefully balance the okay what am i hearing how am i reacting to it how am i going to respond Uh, and it's just it's just not good enough to to nod your head sagely and say yes (laughs) there has to be some kind of response otherwise you put yourself in that racket and and you don't get information yeah. or you, you don't get the what you are seeking from them because the context, they immediately yeah. think you are you are now taking their side, therefore I will close down. And that's a very difficult thing to say, you know, I'm not taking sides. I'm just trying to find hear all the facts before I, I move away. So. Such a challenge it's a, such a challenging task to do when when facts I mean and I guess you know we find ourselves now in a post truth world right where we have mm-hmm. such thing as uh, alternate facts but I think the Balkans were very much marred by that misinformation and you know even the media had a huge role to play but I think one of the one of the interesting insights perhaps or maybe lessons for the broader world and and I begin to hear if you agree Bosnia, when you when you put it into context, or, or you know, former Yugoslavia, it is in the heart of Europe. This is not, you know, this was a, a, a heavily industrialized nation, very very high literacy rate, you know, even to Western European standards, high quality of life. Sarajevo held the 1984 Winter Olympics. So by no no stretch of the imagination was this, you know, a country that you would think, okay, this is the backwater of the world, and you know, of of course they're all fighting. It, it, the, the fact that this was a, such a brutal war at in the heart of Europe, a couple of hours south of Austria. I mean, this is you know, and, 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 and the sheer fact that the other powers felt powerless mm. to intervene. Mm. You no, know, the politics yeah. surrounding the strategic level was immense. Yeah. You no, know? and it wasn't until the Dayton Peace Accord 
was almost forced upon people. You know, enough is enough. You know, we, we are going to come together to stop this. But what has Dayton done? Has it has it has it yeah. created peace, or did it just stop the war? And that's that is a great essay title that a lot of uh, people get. And I'm on the it stopped the war. It didn't yeah. create peace. And the challenges that it faced as the politics went through, the external politics went through. So you had the United Nations, you then had the, then you had intervention force, then they had the peacekeeping force, and I forget all the names. And we, yeah, of course, they all had different badges and, yeah. as it evolved. Uh, and then you have U4 today, which has a Turkish, a large Turkish element to it. Question mark: well, When did Turkey join the EU? Hasn't, yeah. but it's part of the European force because they they see it as something they need to do and they want to be involved in keeping the peace in Bosnia and Herzegovina in particular yeah. and they do a lot of goodwill there others look at it and say oh wait a minute it's Turkish force that's not yeah. very nice is it so and you'll see when you see the lay down of the, uh, the troops as I recall there weren't many Turkish troops in the Republic of Srpska it, yeah of course so again the politics were there uh, right, yeah let's play the game NATO still in there in a part, European forces yeah. in there uh, under Austria. And there was lots of things playing to game. Yeah. But again, both those commanders are under very strict orders and very strict rules of engagement of stuff that you're allowed to do. Bosnia is its own country that looks after itself now. Uh, and only should the Maya hit the fan and the European force commander open his book and see whether he's allowed to intervene and that's a very challenging time for that commander as he may see something but it's not his role uh, it's not his job and he ends up reporting it does it get action yeah. so, so it can be very frustrating but at the same time can be very rewarding because yeah. certainly the resilience of the Bosnian people were what hit me yeah. you know, some of them have been hit extremely hard no, they, as you said, they were an industrial nation, high literacy rate, and suddenly, almost overnight, they've had their universities destroyed, their houses destroyed, uh, and they are picking up the pieces. But still, talk very fondly of the Sarajevo of the the seventies and the, the the Winter Olympics of nineteen eighty four. Yeah. But there are still certain areas where certain citizens of Sarajevo, you say, well, why don't you go and move out into the new yeah. suburb? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not going to move there because I'll, I'll stay here there. where I feel safer here. Yeah, it's 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 scary that that's that that's still the case. I'm conscious of the of the time pool, and I don't don't want to uh, use. I I haven't even looked. Okay. No, that's good. well. Then that's great. Then don't look because I have uh, still have a whole bunch of questions that I that, that I want to touch on. Okay. Um, you you also mentioned that you supported the worldwide operations, tsunamis, disaster relief. Tell us a little bit about that. What what sort of work have you done there? Well, the UK has a central. Defence Logistics Operations mm -hmm. Centre, and I was the operations manager for uh -huh. that for a period of four, I think it was four years in total. And therefore, wherever an operation or something is going on in the world mm -hmm. that requires support, where it was urgent and required intervention, my team of seven or eight people would be involved in some way, shape or form to make sure that it happened. So... For instance, in the tsunami, we were moving food, rations, stores, medical supplies into uh, places like Banda Aceh. So, yeah, okay, so this is the, uh, the Christmas tsunami in, in, in Banda Aceh, is it? Is that the one? Uh, well, in, in the, in the whole of the Indian Ocean. Yeah, okay, right. Yeah. Uh, no, so yes, yeah, so it is the Christmas tsunami. Mm -hmm. Banda Aceh was a hit, yeah. Sri Lanka was hit, yeah. Thailand was hit, I think it was, coast of India. And so in Banda Aceh, we were sending a plane to get goods into Bandache, which had been cut off because of the tsunami. And we sent a, a C-17, and you can imagine the distance from the UK yeah, to yeah. Bandache, not knowing what's on the ground, and therefore making sure what was in the back of the plane not only could help the people of Bandarache, but where necessary, could help us. So C-17 landed, and I think it was a... a, a, a well, I can't remember the plane because I wasn't there, but another plane came in behind the C-17, and nose dived on the runway so it's oh, it's God. nose yeah. it's it's nose wheel collapsed collapsed yeah and blocked the, and blocked the runway so this is the only runway in bandu Eche to bring aid in oh, it's yeah. now blocked luckily on the c17 we had a very large 
mechanical handling equipment, a forklift truck, extremely large one, which we were leaving there. And we had an operator who could operate it very efficiently. And he literally picked up the front of that crashed aircraft, dragged it to the side of the runway, opened the runway again. So all the other planes that are in the air with the aid could still get in. But we had, UK Armed Forces had a big role to play in making that happen and to make sure that aid gets through. And it's a side of the armed forces people don't really see. They see the complex side, but very soon after a, a natural disaster occurs, the first people that may be going in, you've got some very good teams like Team Rubicon, you've got Oxfam and all, all the uh, NGOs. But one of the big things to get in is if the military can get in and open it up, yeah. And these allows these NGOs to get in more freely. They will oh, find it any way they can. Yeah. So yeah. they will get in any way they can because that's the nature of them. Uh, they're there. But in Pakistan, the earthquake in northern Pakistan, uh, I want to say 2005, 2000, mm-hmm. so a squadron of rural engineers were operating there, building schools, building, rebuilding medical centres. Yeah. Yeah. So all happening quietly, but it needed, it needed to happen. And the Pakistani armed forces were pushed, accepted the support. And that's great. But from a British point of view, we also needed to support our troops on the ground to make yeah. sure they had the nails, the hammers, yeah. the wood, the, the petrol to make sure they're chainsaws. So they didn't look like a bunch of idiots who, yeah. I've come to build you a school, but I've got no tools. So uh, the tsunami did tax over. That was something nobody saw coming. And, and a lot happened. And then... Then we had Katrina, the hurricane off America. One of those powerful countries in the world gets hit by a devastating hurricane. And the United Kingdom stood up to the mark and provided support in the form of logistics, food, rations, yeah, yeah. readily available. Now, here are, we are going to provide this free of charge and free of will because you're, yeah. because we're friends and it's people on the ground are suffering and we just want to make sure that we do our part. A lot of the activities I've been involved in have been that humanitarian aid side of how do, how do you get stuff there to that person in the middle of nowhere who's struggling. And that is one of the sort of people see us, see a, a guy in a military uniform, they assume he's got a, a weapon and it, yeah. he's, assume he's there to do bad things. Uh, and I think one of the biggest telling from the things about that, and I'll just go back to that, my time with DA again, we were doing the officer selection process. Mm, yeah. uh, um, and we, we talk about looking through somebody's eyes and we helped the Bosnians develop a campaign to get more people in. And we did that as, I can, I can really say, as a bunch of novices. We haven't got much money, so yeah, we, we, need, we know they need to be able to jump over combat roofs and have a weapon, helmet, yeah. you know, camp cream. They look the part. And then, fortuitously, one of my team was chatting to a public relations team who sit in Sarajevo, and their boss asked if he could get some of his novices to have a look at this and you know, if, if they were happy, give some support, some advice, some, some su- suggestions. And um, wow, well, it was the biggest turn down that I've seen in a very nice way, because that picture of that soldier in all his kit was the most negative thing we could have done to get people into the Bosnian army. Because the Bosnians see the uniform, they see the weapon, okay, yeah. and they immediately think back to the conflict. Yeah. And a simple thing in the next campaign is there were no weapons. The guys were always open shirts, no hats, so you could see their faces. And the final thing was... Uh, I think it was a male and female running along with a dog next to them. And this just changed everybody's opinion. Look at the lovely dog. Isn't it quite peaceful? And then the grandmas and grandfathers who influence heavily the the decisions of their grandchildren. This is actually quite an honorable profession. You should join the armed forces. Wow. What what a story. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's, that's a interesting dimension, right? It's about understanding the context what works in one country or what we're used to in our own societies may not necessarily translate in the same way uh, in a post-conflict environment. And that's, that, that, that takes nuance and time to really understand 
context of a country. That's it. We've, yeah. we've, I, I've never sat through what they did for four years and uh, for the people of Sarajevo. So trying to look in through their eyes is extremely challenging because I've never had that fear. I've never had that lack of dignity for four years. And then listening to them, trying to put myself in their shoes, seeing where they want to go, seeing what they're trying to achieve, and then balancing it with everything else that was going on in the country. Yeah, it was an interesting insight. And and see the compassion in some of them. Even even this morning, they're you know, friends of mine from there who've put on you know, worthy charitable causes for. Yeah. And and you when you know Bosnia Herzegovina and you see who's doing it for whom, you think. Yeah. That, that is crossing a divide. Not many people will see that. They'll say, oh, that's a good idea. But the bigger picture, that is a massive step over a divide. Yeah, the subcontext. These people are doing. Right? Yeah, the subcontext Correct. exists that you don't necessarily understand. Now, to what, to what extent does our, does our kind of, and in this case, Western understanding of war and conflict differ from those who you've worked with overseas? You know, to, so even, even in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you've spent a lot, lot of time there and you've had the chance to understand the context. And that's probably unusual and rather rare because of your experiences. To what extent does do, do other you know development organisations who are there on a, on a rotational basis? To what extent do they take the time to understand, or, or, or how, uh, how is the idea of conflict different? I I think that's one of our big things in that we send people, and so do companies. They send the best people from their own country to do a specific task. And they are probably excellent at that task, but they don't know the people on the other end. Uh, and they can get quite dogmatic because this is the best way to do it. Well, it might be in your country, but actually you've got some very, very high powered, very intelligent people who happen to be cleaning for you because mm. there is no other jobs. If they were in your position, they could have delivered this. The best thing would be to let them deliver it in their own country and for you to step out the way. Or for you to take that cleaner who happens to be a, uh, a civil engineer and can yeah. build a bridge better than you can and say, actually, I want you on my team and I don't want you as an interpreter translator. I want you as a civil engineer uh, and I want you to start doing this bridge and I want you to bring people in from the community to build it. I'm not going to bring in multi-million dollar companies to build a bridge because yeah. there are people here. But it's how, how that transition happened. And I think it's one of the things that we're not very good at. We fight the war and then it stops. And then we start thinking about the transition. Why aren't we good at that? Surely by now we've had plenty of experience around the world. Why, why, why aren't we good at this by now? I, I think we are. And there are certain nations who've got mm. teams who do this. But when there is a, there is a challenge on your defence budget, what, what are you funding? You can't fund everything. So what, what falls over first? I might need a, a, how many people in the armed forces do you need to run a electrical distribution system the size of Iraq? Well, um, I'm not really sure we need any to run yeah. that. But wait a minute, we're now in Iraq and we need somebody to run this. Where, where's Corporal Bloggs? Corporal Bloggs, what's your, uh, what's your ability to run a national yeah. distribution network of, I'm sorry, so I can tie up two generators together but yeah, so yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and we eventually bring in somebody but off to the right is the guy who used to run it right. keep him very quiet because he yeah. he's not sure again we come back to this prisoner of war thing he's not yeah. prisoner of war but he's not yeah. sure yeah. is an occupying force and what are they doing actually when you looked at some of the stuff in iraq it was so old and so out of date compared with the western yeah. style of yeah. distribution he was the only person who knew how it worked but it, it took two or three years before they say, hey, can you? Yeah. Yes, I can. Well, somebody asked the question. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. 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 I know it's backwards. Would you say that that's, um, and, and I'll take the liberty to say, because I've, I've heard from other people as well of your, of your success, particularly as in your role as defense attache, but would you say that was the secret to your success in your role? I, I think so. It, it is that a number of my colleagues, I'm being very careful of how I say this. A number of my colleagues took that first step, you know, mm. I, we're the best, we're going to tell you how to do yeah. it. I came from the position of, well, actually, they're, they're mm. very careful. You've got some very good degrees here. Mm. Why don't we chat this through? Why, why don't we look at 
some of the stuff you're trying to attempt. Why are you trying to attempt it? And from my perspective, I had an unwritten thing in, not, not given to me by the British government, but just yeah. something I set for myself that I was not going to do anything with the Bosnian Armed Forces that involved blowing up anything or training them to fight a war. What I would do was do stuff that trained them to be prepared for humanitarian missions, trained them to be part of a wider organisation. And I was especially looking for those tasks which brought the ethnic groups together and they had to work together to achieve the aim. So, you know, a more than temporary well, interim camp, you could call it, up, yeah. up, at, uh, up in the north near Bani Luka. Manacha took, oh, I think we had six weeks from when the general in Bosnia said, Paul, we need help. Now, that's a big thing for the general who came from that area, and you'll know what I mean when he came from that area, to own up. Now, do you throw that back in his face? Or is this an opportunity to get him on side? Okay, so what can we do to make this happen? You and I know where the, the fault lies, yes. but we're, we're, we're going to leave that to one side. We're just going to make it happen. And the doors that opened afterwards were brilliant to allow one of my staff, almost who's six weeks up in Manacha making it happen so that the Bosnians didn't lose face. I think 20,000 troops came in six weeks later. They had, they had a brilliant interim camp, yeah. which could then be used for humanitarian operations, for training their staff, because they, they have a troop that goes to Bosnia every six months. Mm-hmm. Sorry, mm-hmm. a troop that goes to Afghanistan. Is a, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's right, on rotation. Uh, every six months. So it's rotational, uh, and they use Manacha a lot for training yeah. in yeah. preparation for that. And that is there for them to be able to do that. Yeah. So it's, it is those opportunities I was looking for. And, and sometimes they would come from the most obscure conversation or mm. meeting. You know, somebody would say something and think, actually, that, that would be a doorway into opening up. If we can open that doorway, that's going to open up. Let's do it yeah. now. Uh, and the, the thing for me was, don't rub it in. The individual knows he could do that if... He had the resources. He doesn't. But now he's got the resources, he's going to do it. But I'm not rubbing it in. I'm not coming back to him and saying, oh, you owe me. It's a, uh, we're men of the world. I'll, I'll come and have a cup of coffee with you or chat or whatever. Uh, Let's build trust. Let's build cooperation. Yeah. 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 Build it that actually I'm going to give Paul Marshall a call because there's something else going on and I'd like to discuss it with him. Uh, and that just opens those doors for lots of things. And to this day, I think probably two or three messages a day over Facebook come from Bosnia Herzegovina from different people. You know, a lot of them saying, "When are you coming back? We want to take you for dinner." We yeah. you know, the hospital hospitality of those people who've gone through so much is 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 uh, humbling. Yeah, but uh, uh, but I can also empathise with, with them. Why? Because I think, you know, and going back to that point we talked about before, there's so many people have gone through there. I mean, uh, I think per capita, in particular Bosnia, per capita is... Uh, by far is a country that's received by far the most amount of aid out of any post-conflict country in, in the history of the world. I'll, I'll fact check this myself mm. and, I'll, and I'll probably put in a vignette into this later mm. on, but I'm pretty yeah. sure that's accurate. And, you know, so many people have come through, everybody had their ideas, everybody had their mm. solutions. It's, uh, you know, and I don't say this lightly, but it's very few and far between people that take that type of approach where they actually genuinely care and and allow people and as you said you know a lot of these people are far more educated than you and i and uh, have been forced into situations through no fault of their own to you know be like you said you know a cleaner which is a noble profession in itself anyway but certainly not a profession that this person is trained for you know like you said it could have been a civil engineer who was building bridges to world standard but have now to yeah of, well you know, we, we we were doing some work in Garasha in the east of the country. It was one of those uh, odd plates, uh, along with Srebrenica, Garasha, uh, that uh, was, yeah. yeah. Uh, And internal to that enclave still is a lot of tension in it. And my team were great at identifying people. And we were working with our European colleagues from Bulgaria, from uh, Croatia, and trying to do something in that area. And I just happened to mention that there was a guy I knew who 
probably could act as our point of contact in there. He lived in Garajna, spoke, spoke English very well. So I introduced him to my Croatian and my Bulgarian cat, who thought the world of him. But because of his background, the only job today he could get was a hospital porter. Yeah. He's got a master's degree, couldn't get a job elsewhere, and was very loyal and, stay, and was staying in Garetta. But now I understand he's... Now that opened the door for that individual yeah. who now is doing extremely well. And But it's just those little things yeah. because yeah. that will sow the seed for others to, to build upon. So... Yeah. It's all about the moments, right? So, it is. And, and, and just kind of bringing it towards some of the, maybe a natural conclusion. I want to ask a couple of perhaps personal questions about your time in conflict. How have these experiences changed you and your outlook on life? And, and when you think back now, uh, you know, over, over, over a 34 year career, you know, how has that impacted you? Well, I suppose there are some times that you look back on those 34 years and you think, oh, as the young Second Lieutenant Gung Ho stood in front of the Russian hordes, as we were said then, the yeah. British Army, the Rhine, will yeah. stop them dead. You know, you, you did, it was a, it's a glamorous time. We, we didn't actually f- fight a war. Some of the people I, I started my career with who'd been in for 20 years had never fired a gun in anger. They'd lived in Germany for most of that 20 years. And it was a whole different life then. We then came through the First Gulf War. Well, wait, 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 they're asking us to do what? Yeah. No, this, yeah. did it. Um, at the time, as a young officer, right? This is my job. This is what I. This is what I signed on the dotted line. And I never didn't think that way in going on operations. I've always thought, no, I signed up for the British Army, yeah. and that's my role. It is to follow Queen and Country and do as I'm ordered. But when you start looking at some of these conflicts, you think, okay, you're not thinking about the fighting. You're thinking about the aftermath. So Shiba Log Base, uh, which is in Iraq, well, I say Shiba Log Base, Shiba Airfield, which is in southern Iraq. We moved into Shiba Log Base. We cleared an area. We moved the whole of the battalion in. 48 hours later, we were painting a school because that we thought that was the best. That we, we'd met some of the locals. The school had been trashed by the Iraqi forces. And we thought, actually, we got some paint. So the the school actually got painted in military camouflage paint because that's all the paint we had. (laughs) had, Yeah, yeah. But it was the guys who were doing the painting had a weapon strapped to their back and they had their body armor on and their helmet on. But you're painting a school and thinking, actually, we're, we're beginning to think it's not just about the fight, it's about what's the follow on. Uh, can we can we get these kids back to normality? Where's the teacher? Oh, do you want to come and teach? Yeah, but I've got no books. Don't worry. We've got some paper yeah. here somewhere from the yeah. photocopier. Uh, here's a couple of pencils we've got. Uh, and then we'll bring in our uh, our teams that we know are there. Look, yeah. can you help? Uh, and it was those kind of... So it changes from I'm just going through and I'm going to punch through the enemy and yeah. come out to yeah. actually, yeah, I've done that bit now, but I need to be thinking about tomorrow, the next next day, and how can I get these people back? Because if they don't like us, it's just going to throw up in our face. And and we we did see that in a bit in Iraq. And I don't think anybody considered a population that had been so controlled for so many years suddenly let off the hit. And all those thiefdoms, all those tribal interfightings, suddenly you are the guy or you are the force in the middle of it. And... There's nothing you are going to do to stop it. Should somebody have known? I don't think anybody would have known. Yeah. It's, it's just another one of those, it's a point in history. Yeah. We, un, we took the, the plug out, but yeah. we didn't actually know where the water was going. And when we saw the bath empty, you're thinking, oh my God, we should have kept the water in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's a hard lesson, uh, hard lesson mm-hmm. to learn. Uh, what surprised you the most about war? Man's ability to inflict pain on man. So, even to this day, uh, trained to fire a rifle, trained to fire a pistol, yeah. aimed at targets, aimed at... The sheer fact that somebody can do it without thinking, without remorse, moving on, and the sheer fact that it, for some people it doesn't matter who gets killed, injured, maimed. Yeah. 
it's not their problem, it's somebody else's problem. They've moved on. And on the other side, the sheer strength of some of the people who have gone through tremendous adversity, that they come out the other side with compassion, wanting to do better, wanting to make sure their country doesn't go the way it had been going and fall yeah. back in that way. And knowing that some of them sitting around a room knew a lot of people, not of things about the other one, yeah. but were willing to roll with it. And you're there again, there's something underlying here. I don't really know what it is, but I, know enough. Going on, yeah. I was uh, privileged. I was fortunate. I don't think these are the right words to describe the fact that I got to know yeah. what, in some cases, what that underlying thing was and thought, and you're happy to sit there and work with them now. Whew. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So they were the guy on the other side of the line firing at you, but now you're shaking hands, working on what you're going to do next in your yeah. country. And that is a tremendous step forward to be able to do that. And tremendous strength um, of mo moral courage if, uh, and strength of character to, to, to take that forward. Sorry, you about to say something else? No, I, I, I would fully support you. It's that full moral, moral stance to say <laughs> enough's enough. I need to go there. Yeah. And, and some of the people, are, I don't know who you call, there was a, the second, there were two ladies commissioned into the Bosnian Armed Forces mm -hmm. through their selection process, the mm -hmm. first two ladies ever. Unfortunately, one of them was killed in a road traffic accident in 2015. And the team said to me, oh, what are we going to do? I said, well, in the UK, a military, we would go down and pay respects because it's a fellow officer. I said, but I, I don't know enough about your culture because this is something that we just didn't cover in my training. You know? yeah. I said, well, I would like, if possible, to go and pay my respects to a fallen officer. I have a great deal of respect. So the team said, oh, yeah, why don't we do it? I said, no, no, is it, is it one, yeah. is it the right thing to do? Am I going to offend somebody? Because if they am, then I'll stay away. And so they made a couple of calls and I turned up. I didn't enter the mosque. So I stayed outside the mosque grounds. We then went up to the funeral or the cemetery and we, we, hang back, we hung back. There must have been two or 300 people in the cemetery. You know, Well-respected young lady from the village yeah. she came from. They all passed. They all went away. Uh, and then I went forward with, with my small team of three just to pay our respects, as you would do in the UK. And somehow a message got through to her father that there was a guy in a foreign uniform at the grave doing something. And you know, within, within about two or three minutes, he was back asking me what I was doing. And I said, well, I, I, I knew your daughter very well. I saw her through the training and I just wanted to come and pay my respects and not get him in your way. And after about two minutes of talking, he said, I would like you to come back to the house. So well, I, I don't want to impose or anything else. And it should, you're not imposing because you are one of the few people that know my daughter. There's an awful lot of officers down at my house who tell me her name, but they don't know her. The, the, the sheer things that I knew what she liked in sports. I knew she yeah. dyed her hair. I knew the challenges she'd faced yeah. in, in her training. And we could, and her, she'd clearly spoken to that, to her father about it. And he was just, he knew me and he knew that I'd been involved yeah. and he was delighted. So I sat down with him at the funeral feed, get the correct name of it. So we had this wake and I sat next to the father for an hour and a half thinking, I'm not really prepared for this. Yeah. I'm not sure, but I just know I shouldn't leave. And I just need to carefully tread my way through, keep engaged, because I've got a lot of senior Bosnian armed forces around me. And it's a sensitive minefield. Potential. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, but... But what a wonderful me, human experience. What a wonderfully human uh, connection, you know, to... to you know, one's situation of the father, you know, to, to realize that this is somebody who knew his daughter perhaps better than anyone else there because you saw no. her through all her training. Yeah, and the anger he must have been feeling, not yeah. towards the armed forces. No, um, course, luckily, yeah. Fortunately, it was a road traffic accident. But 
but the anger he must have been feeling. And then there's this foreign guy. Well, what's he doing? Why? Yeah. I, I need to go back and check. And he he had the heart and the courage to say, well, actually, yeah. come and take a, a special seat yeah. because of the yeah yeah. To, to, and and also be at to, my to, table. Yeah, to and also to honour your your moral courage in a way. I mean, that took moral courage courage from him, but also to honour yours for you know arguably doing doing the right right thing as you saw being right not knowing the cultural context or otherwise i think that's a that's a tremendous tremendous effort uh, may, maybe my last question what what has and, and i know even since leaving you've been you've been you know you couldn't sit still and and you you've gone to achieve more great things but what has motivated what motivates you what drives you especially given all that you've seen and and as you start as you, as you said at the, at the start and i think it's become very apparent what you meant that you know uh, your career was certainly going to be shaped by humanitarian uh, efforts and that you would see a lot of suffering from that first from your first experiences what what is what has and does motivate you i enjoy helping people towns places whatever and seeing that help develop into something that is good. I, as you say, I, I left the armed forces in 2017. I did a job for uh, it's five weeks, yeah. but they took me to Papua New Guinea. They took me up to the highlands of Papua New Guinea. And I met with some tremendous Papua New Guineans who are working for some international firms in those areas. And Again, highly educated, a couple of them who are educated here in Australia. And just taking the time to sit and listen. And again, maybe every six months, I'll get an email from one of them saying, hey, Paul, you always said if I I had an issue I didn't know how to address, just bounce it off you. And just responding to them and saying, okay, this is how I deal with it. This is all. By the way, you might want to speak to this person because... They are the expert in that field. And by the way, he's he's more than happy for you to reach out. Yeah. I wouldn't be giving you his address if I didn't. Yeah. But he he can help you get through that. And it's, when I say get through it, it's, we're not talking about a humanitarian mission. Yeah. We're talking about his normal day-to-day business yeah. where yeah. Uh, he's trying to find a way forward or something, but he's caught at every way forward by uh, your pattern again and will bring somebody else in. Yeah. Well, actually, just by doing something, you can do it yourself. And, and I, I love that challenge of meeting new people, meeting new cultures. And something somebody taught me, and I still play to it this day, is we all have a natural bias. And I discovered under some of my cultural training, it's, it's not a negative bias, but it's mm. just a bias. Always do something because you always do something. And my trainer said, what I just want you to do is pretend you've got a pair of binoculars and I want you to physically turn through 180 degrees and I want you to bring the binoculars to your eyes and I want, to, I want you to look from their perspective, not from your perspective. He says, I, I say you've got a pair of binoculars because it makes you think. And I thought, oh, come on, this is, this is good. And he said, no, give, give it a go. He said, so you're now sitting on the other side. You're not a British Army officer. You're an officer of the Bosnian Armed Forces. Right, so you're trying to achieve what? So what's going through your mind as a Bosnian Arsenal Forces officer rather than what's going through your mind as a British Army officer? Well, I'm thinking about X one. He said, exactly. So you're not thinking exactly the same. You're trying to achieve the same thing, but he has different pressures, different stances, different things that he's permitted to do. His background is different. And therefore, just try and look through his eyes and you might find some common ground. And if you find that common ground, then start building on that common ground. But don't try and impose your culture on another culture. We all are equal cultures and they are as intelligent as you are. And if you could speak their language as well as they can speak English, you're probably uh, a better person. What a wonderful challenge, I think, but also a, a really empowering lesson on how to, how to do good not just development work but just how to do good in the world and, and i think your career throughout has certainly shown that and and and, I, and again i say this 
quite openly. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure to speak with a lot of people who've worked with you and, and, and they all echo the same, that Paul is one of those people who uh, gets things done. But uh, I think importantly, he listens, takes the local perspective. I want to thank you really for taking the time. Uh, we've spoken more than an hour and a half now, which uh, which uh, I know is, uh, is quite a long time. So I really do appreciate it. It's fantastic insights. And I wish you all the best. And I look forward to chatting again in the future. Okay, that would be very good. And we'll uh, make sure I can get the uh, my wife and your good lady together to chat and Absolutely. talk about things that they chat about which <laughs> the only is where i'm cult <laughs> i'm culturally biased in this yeah, case that's right <laughs> and we'll never get over this bias and both of you and i are going to be in trouble <laughs> exactly no problem at all wonderful thank you paul Speak okay soon. no problem at all hope to see you soon thanks for joining us for another episode of the voices of war you can access all episodes on www.thevoicesofwar.com or by subscribing wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And while you're there, please give us a review as we'd love to hear what you think. If you'd like to recommend a guest for the show, you can reach me on info at thevoicesofwar.com.